New York has more skyscrapers than Beijing, Seoul and Toronto combined. In fact, only Shenzhen and Hong Kong have more skyscrapers than the Big Apple. You could say Manhattan is bursting with them. You might say it's completely full. That makes it especially challenging for new developments to be built, forcing more and more creative solutions to increasingly nebulous plots of land. We've seen the super slender skyscraper, skyscrapers built on top of existing skyscrapers. We've seen skyscrapers on stilts built over protected parts of the city. But we've never seen anything quite like this before. This site sits on the banks of the East River. Over here is an existing building. This section is protected parkland. That leaves only here and here available for new construction. Only the developer didn't want to build two skyscrapers, they wanted to build just one. So what did they do? Well, they bent the skyscrapers together in the middle, creating one building and an engineering nightmare. The secret to why these buildings don't fall over? See this sky bridge? Well, it moves. New York has its fair share of icons, striking silhouettes on its skyline that are unmissable or completely avant-garde. This is the American Copper Building. It's provided an arresting new addition, quickly gaining notoriety, not just for its stark appearance as two slender towers bent to the hip, leaning into each other, but because of one remarkable engineering secret hidden in plain sight that helps it remain upright. But before we reveal how that's possible, we have to look at the restraints that necessitated this building's bizarre shape. As much as we like to think of skyscrapers as purely artistic creations, enormous sculptures that decorate our skylines and provide iconography for their cities, they are, first and foremost, inventions of commerce. The average price of land in Manhattan is $2,580 per square foot. That makes it one of the most expensive cities in the world to develop or build on, right up there next to Monaco and Hong Kong. It also means two more things. Number one, if you're going to build in New York, you need bang for your buck. And number two, every inch of this island is extremely valuable, even sites that initially appear impossible to construct anything on. This is the site we showed you before where the American Cop building now stands. Cost aside, another hindrance for developers in New York is zoning. Now, zoning came about precisely because of the city's abundance of tall, dense buildings. It enacted America's first comprehensive zoning resolution in 1916, designed to address concerns about overcrowding, light and air quality in the quickly growing metropolis. Before zoning laws, the city's development was largely unregulated, leading to this extreme density. Over the following decades, zoning laws evolved to reflect changing urban needs. In 1961, New York City introduced a new zoning resolution that remains the foundation of its land use regulations to this day. The overhaul introduced the concept of floor area ratio, which controls building density, as well as incentives for open space and mixed use developments. Basically, zoning dictates what you can build and where. Whether spaces can be residential, commercial or retail, how tall they can be, balancing economic growth, housing needs and environmental concerns. Which brings us back to the American Copper site. My name is Greg Pascarelli. I am an architect in New York and one of the founding uh, principles of Shop Architects. And on the American Copper Building, it was it was my project. Uh, I led the team along with my partner Chris Sharpless and Dana Getman. We helped build the buildings, and then I even lived there for five years. So uh, I know the building incredibly well. Because of designated parkland and a school that was to be constructed, the only place where they could build their towers were these two separate spaces, leaving no other option than to build two separate towers. Now, honestly, it's pretty tough to get your head around how this building really looks in context through footage alone, which is why we put so much effort into the 3D graphics that you see in our videos. But models like this aren't easy, especially when you've got two skyscrapers leaning into each other with an impossible sky bridge between them. That's why we're really excited to work with the team at Snaptrude on today's video to fully recreate these towers using their powerful design tools. Now, this isn't just another 3D modeling tool. Snaptrude takes a unique approach to early stage design. They pair fast and easy 3D modeling with building program data which means quicker decision-making and a more seamless transition to the later stages of design. 
Now that's important because crucial decisions aren't just determined by the appearance of a building, but by the data that represents it. Normally, design teams find themselves jumping between multiple disconnected tools just to put together a simple design concept or a presentation for their clients. And trust me, I've seen firsthand how messy things can get when architects are on a deadline, sleep deprived and having to juggle multiple different tools all at once. With Snaptrude, that entire process is brought together into a powerful workflow that integrates programming, space planning, massing, presentation and BIM all in one collaborative cloud-based platform. And to celebrate the release of Snaptrude 3.0, they're letting you build your first three projects for free. Just scan the QR code on screen or head to the link in the description. Video sponsors like Snaptrude are what enable our channel to function and to keep bringing you great content. So please do go and take the time to check them out. We would really appreciate it. Now, let's get back to the real American copper building. I think what's interesting about, about the building was that it had gone through a rezoning that allowed for those two towers to be on the site of what was a former uh, power plant. But to go through a rezoning is a very complicated and costly process in New York. What could you do with this really boring plan to make these buildings really stand out? The developers were set on building one tower with shared amenities, not two. They could have petitioned the zoning regulations, but even if they were successful, it would have taken years. Instead, they went to the architects and asked them to find an impossible solution. Greg and his team came up with pretty much every idea they could think of. They had a pie-in-the-sky mentality. No idea too crazy or unrealistic was discounted. They landed on connecting the buildings with a bridge, essentially making them one building. The architects loved it, and the engineering team braced themselves for an enormous challenge. I think the engineering team was thrilled. There was like, you know, not something that they get to do every day. And um, we had found that a bridge uh, between buildings hadn't been done in many decades in New York. So there wasn't even really a lot of the expertise in the city, in the construction industry. And um, uh, JDS, who, who built the building as well as developed it, uh, really came up with some, some uh, inventive ways of getting that bridge built. Further complicating matters, if the bridge went in a straight line between the two towers, it would go over the schoolyards, which wasn't allowed to happen. In order for it to go over their land, they'd have to bend the buildings. The approved master plan had a school on the southwest corner and a park on the northeast corner. And then one tower was on the southeast corner and one tower was on the northwest corner. We could get the bridge across, but it couldn't go over the schoolyard because that was not allowed to have something floating over the outdoor space where the children played. So it had to really kind of sneak by there and then it also because one building is bending one way and the other building is bending the other way the bridge is actually not orthogonal it's a parallelogram that folds in two directions so that it meets the buildings in the correct geometry so it was it's even though it's just kind of this little three-story tube it's actually a wildly complicated uh uh structure one tower bends on the long axis and the other bends on the short axis each floor on each tower moves slightly closer to each other as they reach the sky bridge. Then it bends away from the bridge again as it rises. It's the east tower that leans the most, by 22 centimeters each floor. And that's what creates this kind of beautiful dance between the two buildings. So it was taking something very banal and very straightforward and pushing it to its limits to making a kind of sublime statement about a tower on a waterfront in a city like New York. But sitting on the banks of the East River meant this building could be prone to intense hurricane-level winds and flooding. Now, all buildings sway a little on their own naturally, and special engineering precautions are taken for that. So this is a, this is a really important thing. Um, you know, buildings move, and um, that's how they are safe. <laughs> and and what you, when you're in a building that doesn't move, you're in trouble. But when you add a bridge to the equation, it gets particularly difficult. The two buildings could sway at different rates and speeds. And if that happened, they would risk ripping the bridge apart. They estimated that each tower could move by up to 30 centimeters. So because they're two towers, they could move differentially. And if you had the bridge connected to both buildings, when they move differentially, it the bridge would fall apart. 
To solve this, the bridge is actually only connected to one of the towers. On the other end, it slides back and forth on huge Teflon plates. I've been up there and you can see the building. You don't even feel it, but you can see the buildings uh, slightly moving. This type of sky bridge is one of a kind and has never been done before. So the construction process was a nerve wracking one. They first built a temporary bridge by throwing ropes across the two buildings until they could make scaffolding. One of the key leaders from JDS was a former uh, uh, Division I college uh, football quarterback. I think he might have thrown the football across to, to get the first rope so they could start bringing materials back and forth and begin to build, begin to build the bridge. Each piece of the bridge was prefabricated and incredibly strong and was lifted piece by piece into place. Now they could rest easy knowing the building would be safe in hurricane level winds. So was building the bridge actually worth it? Well, cleverly, Greg and his team put many of the shared amenities for the two towers within this structure. Well, the idea of the sky bridge came from the idea that each building could have had a very standard amenities package like any other building. But if we combined it into one, we could make the single best one in the city. We said, well, why don't we connect it at the closest point and create this incredible place for the community and everyone who lives there to be to come together. And very quickly we said, well, what program should go on the on the bridge? And it, it was very clear it should be the swimming pool. Because where else can you swim from one skyscraper to the other 300 feet in the air? But what about flooding? Before the towers began their rise in the skyline, foundations were dug 15 meters down. But the water table was only one meter below the surface. As they dug, they needed to stop the site from flooding, so they created a huge concrete perimeter wall like an enormous bathtub, and then they pumped the water out. It was a slow process, taking a full year and a half to complete, but it meant the towers effectively became isolated from flooding. I think we were pumping 1.5 million gallons of water out of the site every day. Uh, because the river would just sort of pour in and you kind of dump it back out. But yeah, so the, you had to build a bathtub and then you build the, the foundations through there and then the garage through there and then you get back up to grade and then you start the towers. As the towers rose on the skyline, each of their tilts looked to pedestrians at first as incredibly alarming. Firefighters were even called because people thought the buildings were falling over. We got calls that the fire department and the police were all over the job site and like I had to get there right away. And everyone was around and they had the drawings out and, and I could hear the firemen saying, uh, who would design a building like this that leads over? And I kind of just stepped away from the crowd and got back in a cab and went. Engineers even had to show blueprints to reassure emergency responders that it was perfectly safe. Finishing touches involved covering the building in copper. This was in fact the first copper skyscraper facade in New York, which, as you might have guessed, is where the building gets its name from. The exterior features over 4.25 million pounds of raw copper, making it one of the largest applications of copper on a high-rise in the world. The choice was both aesthetic and functional. Over time, the material would develop a natural patina, gradually transitioning from its original reddish hue to a deep brown and eventually to a greenish tone like the Statue of Liberty. I think it was very important to us to have a natural material and we wanted something that would age and patina gracefully over the decades. And it will turn Statue of Liberty green, but um, it absolutely gives me a reason to eat healthier because I would like to live long enough to see the buildings turned completely green. The aging process not only enhances the building's visual identity, but also provides durability, as copper is highly resistant to corrosion and requires minimal maintenance. With the towers now complete, the American Copper Building has brought the Sky Bridge back to New York for the first time in some 80 years. A so-called Sky Bridge renaissance has been happening all over the world in recent times. Like the one at the American Copper Building, these structures can share amenities and mechanical flaws. They can create new connections and open our cities up. When done correctly, sky bridges can even make a building stronger, helping to distribute wind loads. As our urban areas get denser, there's been debate surrounding their comeback. The Petronas Towers, Marina Bay Sands, Sapphire by the Gardens have all brought the Sky Bridge back to great success. As for Greg, 
Well, he and his family have now moved out of the towers. The building was a wild success. People loved it. People loved being there. It was sad to leave. It was. There, you know, I, I've got to design another building for me to move into soon. So that's yeah. that's the goal. <laughs> if you want to make your own incredible 3D models like these, then go and check out that link to Snaptrude down there in the video description. We really appreciate it when you guys take the time to go and check out our video sponsors. Don't forget that we're inspiring the next generation of skyscraper builders through our investment into BrickBorrow, a fantastic Lego subscription service. You can learn more and get started today over at BrickBorrow.com. And as always guys, if you enjoyed this video and you want to lean in to the definitive video channel for construction, make sure you subscribe to the B1M.